Great Base Podcast number 64. I'm Steve Smith. I'm with Brandon Flanagan. 64. Is it the $64,000 question? How I remembered how to to the uh, eight times eight, and I got sick on the floor. Eight times eight, sick on the floor. And then the Beatles song. There's a lyric, right? When I'm 64. I'm a little too young for that one. <laughs> a, little, a little too young. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to have a conversation with a club pro. We're going to call Steve Roberts up. Steve Roberts, I met Steve at Ferris State. Ferris State in Michigan, PTM program. We'll talk to him about that. I was in a room with maybe 45 students. Another um, Ferris State alum, who you know quite well, Chad Burial. He was working so hard. I said, all right, Burial, I'll, I'll take you to Michigan. What a treat. A little, a little, <laughs> little bonus. No, Michigan's a great place. Plus, when I went with him, I've, I've been up to Ferris State three times. I actually saw a hockey game with, him. I was with, with, with Barry Hill. So Steve was in the room, maybe 40, 50 students. Name was picked out of a hat. He was in the lineup, top six. And I made a video. We filmed his strokes, and that's what was part of the presentations. I made a video for him. And you know, the Ferris State students were exposed to so many different speakers. So he really was very appreciative, very grateful. He didn't really look at the tape after that. It was just, thank you very much. And of course, he was in the middle of the season, a college student. But out of curiosity, after he graduated and he was working, Chad became the coach at Ferris State. So Steve called him up and Burial said, aren't you the guy that we made a video for? He goes, yeah, that was me. And he goes, well, what have you done with the tape? He goes, well, I really haven't watched it. And Burial said, you need to go back and watch it. And from that, you know, he worked on his own game and then he's changed uh, how he teaches tennis. But American tennis would be so much better off if we had a lot of Steve-O's, uh, Steve Roberts. We'll have to talk to him. He's in Saratoga, California. And you and I being from upstate New York is, uh, which, which is better? Well, Saratoga, New York, for sure. Way better than Saratoga, California. You have to realize we don't have Andy Fitzell. We're going to get him back in the mix. He's in Germany right now with his lovely wife, coaching pro tennis on the road. But from a technological standpoint, I am am amateur hour. (laughs) But even with Andy, uh, I'm still amateur hour. But dialing for Steve Roberts. There you go. One ring. That's a good sign. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Steve. Steve, oh, great to have you on the phone. Steve, how you doing? <laughs> good, good. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. No, no. It's a pleasure it's... to be with you guys today. Yeah, I look forward to having a tennis conversation with you. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about Steve Roberts, your beginning days in tennis. Yeah, no, sounds good. Um, you know, I got a late start in tennis. I started at the age of 13. Um, you know, normally that's, that's, that's super late for most people. Um, my, uh, my mom was taking lessons and, you know, I was just picking up balls and, you know, the coach decided to rally with me a little bit and I can get a couple back. And, you know, I, I, I played sports growing up. I, uh, I played soccer, played some hockey, um, was constantly playing football and street basketball. Um, so I had a little bit of athletic ability, um, could rally a little bit right away. Um, you know, then I went on to play high school, played USDA, um, wasn't, wasn't great in the juniors, probably 50, 60 in, uh, the rankings in Northern California. Um, you know, so, so out of high school, I didn't have any offers. Um, and then, uh, I ended up going to Foothill College, um, so I don't, Steve, I don't know if you've heard of Foothill. Isn't that where uh, uh, Brad Gilbert went there, correct? Brad Gilbert went there, yeah. No, his coach and, there is uh, a famous guy. Um, was he, Shivington, was Tom he, Shivington. Yeah, was he there when you were there? He wasn't there when I was there. Um, the, the coach that I had, his name was Dixie Macias, but he was uh, Shivington's assistant for a long time. And... Um, you know, so Dixie learned under Shivington, you know, the, the ways. Um, I actually think Brad Gilbert, when Brad Gilbert was there, he, um, I think he played number two. You know, he didn't no, even play, he didn't play number one. I think there was a Swedish guy in front of him. I don't know the guy's name. 
Oh, there's a great story about Chivington because uh, Gilbert grew really late, and he was small yeah. and and um, just really helping with his inner belief system, which is number one. And yeah, Gilbert's a great story. At one time, he was so so frustrated he stopped playing. He was 16, uh, but yeah, he um, he also finished uh, second in the NCAs. Um, but no, was it second? Yeah, I think Pepperdine, right? Yeah, he went to either Arizona, Arizona State first. Then he then he went back home to Foothills. Um, but okay. Yeah, his sister, older sister Dana was a touring pro. But I love Gilbert. I mean, I don't want to digress, but he's uh, I, I really do like him as a commentator. But no, I yeah, uh, wish yeah, Chivington. Uh, there's a lot of successful stories out of uh, Foothills. Chivington and then went on the tour with him. I'm pretty sure for a while. Yeah, no. If you listen to Gilbert talk, uh, he really gives him so much credit for, I mean, he got to be number four in the world. Um, yep. Yep. So anyways, yeah, no, Foothill was, uh, they're one of the top community colleges in the state of California. Um, so that, that helped me a lot. They had a great program. Um, you know, I was able to play many, many hours there. The coach helped me a lot. Um, I was able to start really building my game and, 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 and putting in the work. Um, so that was a good, that was a good stepping stone. I was only there for one year. Um, then I went to, uh, Ferris state. So, um, I heard about, I heard about Ferris state from a friend. Um, he goes, man, they got, they got a tennis major here. You should come here. And I, you know, I love tennis. So I looked into it. Um, it's called professional tennis management. Um, Ferris state it's located in Michigan. Um, so right after I finished my foothill season, I, I applied got in, you know, I figured, man, I'm, I'm just going to play tennis all the time. I'm going to do tennis classes. I'm, you know, I'm all in. Um, you know, when I got there, I realized that, um, yes, there's tennis classes, but you know, it's, it's a four year degree and you can either go into the, uh, resort management side or you could do the marketing side. Um, so anyways, I chose marketing, um, probably chose marketing because I thought it was going to be easier so I could play more tennis. Um, but, uh, no, fair state was, was very good for me. Um, how about the cold weather first got there? That must've been a shocker. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't know anything about that at first. I, you know, I applied to the school. I didn't know anything about Michigan. You know, when I got there, the weather was great, you know, weather wasn't too bad to play outside and, you know, you're only there for about a month and a half, mid October, it starts snowing. I'm going, oh, dang, you know, <laughs> I'm going, I'm a, I'm a Northern Cal boy, you know, I'm out here, you know, my mom had, uh, we had bought, bought me a winter coat, you know, um, in August before, um, to get ready for that. But yeah, no, those, those were brutal. Um, so yeah, no, I learned a lot about the snow, uh, at Ferris. And did you have, so, just, did you have one, just one coach the time you were there or more than one? We had, we had, we had one coach there. Um, his name was Alex Palladino. Um, I'd I met, believe he I'd, up, I'd met him. I don't really know him, but I was up there three different times. He grew up in, know. I think he grew up in Kalamazoo area. I think he went to Kalamazoo college. So played D three. Um, he was, he, he was a really good player. I want to say he got to the finals of NCAA division three, um, when he was playing. So, um, didn't he you know, speak? he didn't help us. Did he stay yeah. f- stay fit and play the age groups too? I think he played the age groups as well. Um, no, he. I thought he was really good on, you know, strategy. Um, you know, he was a good player, so he could he could really help us. Plus, definitely helped us in the doubles. He had a lot of doubles experience, um, so he got us coming forward quite a bit. Steve, what was your so, experience like uh, training as a junior? Were you a part of a of an academy? Did you? Did you take yeah, private lessons? So, yeah, I, I, so I started at 13. Um, I was saying my mom's taking lessons. I'm picking up balls. You know, right right after the coach rallied with me, he, you know, he saw I can hit the ball back and forth. He goes, hey, we we, we should sign you up for the academy. You know, and I, I didn't know anything, but, but I could block a ball back with zero form. And, um, you know, I think it was the next week or two weeks later, I started training four hours a day. Um, you know, and after a couple months of that, I'm 
you know, I'm catching on pretty quick, starting to, you know, develop a serve. You know, I spent hours just in my front yard, just throwing a ball at the, at the pitch back system. Um, so I, I felt I had a lot of good tools in terms of playing sports early on. And then, um, yeah, from there I, I was all in, it, it was four hours a day, pretty much all summer. And then a couple hours after school from there till, you know, 18, 19. And then, um, you know, things took off in college. I feel like, um, the coaches in college really helped me, uh, develop. The style of instruction in your junior program or your junior academy, what was that like? Yeah, no, um, it was funny to look back now and, and it was, it was definitely game based, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was game based, you know, just having fun. Um, I ended up doing that for a few years before I went to a little bit more serious academy for a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, no game, game based, not, not much, uh, form based, like, like I run today. Yeah. I've, so. This is really our first conversation, but I've, I've followed you on social media. I think it's one of the, one of the coolest things about technology is to, to have that connection. And then of course, to, to see how your, your players are hitting the ball and how you're coaching, um, on the West coast. So kind yeah. of a long time admirer of what you're doing with your program out there. And so I'm just curious how, you know, how, of course, how you trained as a junior and, and just talking to Steve, um, Obviously, you you did make some changes in your own game, and uh, you know how how that. Yeah, no, that's uh, that, that's a funny story. Um, you know, I think I think Steve was at Ferris State for a. Uh, I must have been a weekend seminar. You know, yeah, the, yeah, the we talked about that. In. We talked about that briefly yeah. when we intro intro you. But go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it was a it was a weekend seminar. Uh, you know, my name got drawn out of the hat. Um, you know, at the time, I think I was playing three singles at, uh, for the school, and I was I was one of the better professional tennis management uh, players, you know, in the program. And uh, you know, I think, you know, I think my name was drawn out of the hat on purpose. You know, maybe it wasn't actually in the hat, but you know, Steve Steve then filmed me, put me through the tiebreak test. Um, of course, um, I failed the tiebreak test. I was trying to overhit, and you know, didn't didn't have the right strokes yet. Um, and then right after that, you know, we went over the film and, and Steve goes, man, you, uh, your backhand volley, you know, you got the fo- forehand volley grip for it. You just, you just go straight down. I had a reset swing on the backhand. I had a slight palm up on the serve. So man, he just, he just broke me down like in front of the whole school. <laughs> and, uh, so that, that's pretty, that's pretty funny looking back at that. And, um, you know, this was right before my senior year and, uh, you know, I thought about it. I I started to make the changes for a few days and I'm going, you know what, you know, who, who, who's this Steve Smith guy that's telling me that I need to straighten my leg before the shots. You know, I'm, my coaches have always told me to stay down. Right. So funny story. I, I didn't make the changes right away. I, I ended up just playing my senior season, um, you know, and then after I graduated, moved back to California and, uh, you know, there's this DVD in my, in my bedroom. It says, you know, Steve Roberts strokes, um, tennis Smith, you know, on it. And, um, I'm like, you know what, I'm starting to coach tennis. Let me just look at this. You know, I'm starting to work on my game started looking into it and I'm going, man, this makes a lot more sense now looking at this, you know, than it did when I was playing college tennis, you know, now that I'm starting to work with players, you know, it, it just, it simplified everything. And you, um, you also called Barry Hill up, right? Cause he, by that time he, he was with, with us yeah, when we did yeah. the workshop and then, then he, he's a, yep. a, like yourself. So a, I met Chad as grad. well. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then I just, you know, so after I graduated, I go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to start watching, you know, Steve's videos. I'm going to, I'm going to start paying attention to this stuff. I'm going to start, you know, learning how to teach tennis, you know, better. And started just applying this to my own game. You know, I spent three, four months, you know, making the changes that Steve suggested. Um, you know, and then from there I was, I was still fit. I was trying to play tournaments. And, um, I remember my first tournament back after making all these changes, um, 
from playing this kid, Anthony Sotokov. I remember this match very clearly. Um, you know, Anthony was a blue chip recruit. I think he was in his second year at Stanford. Anyways, I'm, I'm playing this match and I'm hanging tough. And, you know, in my mind, I'm going, man, how am I hanging with this guy? You know, um, up, up five, four in the first set, end up losing seven, five, um, you know, up five, four in the second set, end up losing seven, five. But, you know, I walked away from that match going, holy moly, this information is that I've applied to my game is, is just gold. And, and, you know, really after that is when I decided like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with this, you know, I'm going to, I got to show this to all my players I'm working with. And, um, you know, from there on out, I've been all in. Um, so actually with the videotape, uh, not too long ago, I'm not sure what Dave Ramos's official title is with the USTA, but he, I, I think you could say he's a video guy. And he, he like yeah, himself, he's a Ferris is a, State guy too. Is he, he's, I know he coached Ferris State. Is, is he, I think he's also a Ferris he State graduate. To, yep. yeah. He went to Ferris State too. Yeah. So he came out to Happy Lane. Uh, so as you know, we were, you know, three years, five miles away from the USTA. And um, Andy spent, Andy Fitzell spent a ton of time uh, coaching in the, in the uh, player development section. But Dave came okay. out, Dave came out and had a video made. And I told him, I said, you need to get together with Matt Clore. Now who's a national coach. Um, Matt really just needed some band-aids, but uh, there's a video story with, with every, everybody we work with. If, if you're not a complete beginner, we have to video first. And um, Matt was an excellent tennis player. And my son was playing under Matt when he, he was being, when he was a college coach at Florida state. I, my uh, son said, uh, nobody can meet Matt. So I, so, I, so we made a videotape and, um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting story, but Matt just had to tweak his game a little bit, but yeah, we did that with, with Ramos. He came out and sk- he was skill tested and made a technical tape and, um, you know, then, then it really turns to our number one mentor is Braden with, uh, fundamentals, you know, where you have the rationale where there's math to explain what you're teaching. Um, are you, are you, do you still have time to work on your game now or not so much? Um, I would, I would say now it's getting a little tougher. You know, I've just started this homeschool program, you know, so that's added, you know, another 15 more hours, um, a week at least that I'm doing. Um, so I haven't, you know, too much in, in the last few months, but yeah, I know up until then I've been working quite a bit, you know, um, still like to demo, you know. How old are you? Now? How old are you now? I'm 32. 32 so. so you can play the play the 35 soon. Yeah, no, I think it's important yeah. to because uh, once you, I think Jim Lair, who we're big fans of, I heard him say one time, uh, "Once you stop, it's so difficult to start again." Uh, and I would, did some work for TCA Tennis Corporation America, the GM of their, I think I'd call it their flagship in Chicago, Mike Mahoney. His thing is he plays a set a day. No matter who you play, if you just go out and play, you know, maybe a quick no ad. Yeah, once you stop playing, you can really lose it. Um, oh yeah, for sure. But if you no, I definitely try to hit a little bit with the kids, but uh, you know it's getting tougher and tougher when you're just standing out there for eight, sometimes nine hours. So yeah, I think that's where the Burwash line we use all the time: be two percent selfish, where you work on your demos and you jump in there, hit a few balls, um, because you can lose your playing skills. You know, Demonstration skills are much easier to keep. Um, you know, for oh, years yeah. in training tennis coaches, coaches, you know, I worked in this academic setting for a decade, and people would say, you want me to use my real game or my teaching game? And <laughs> it, that's when they were beginners in this program. And then they found out that uh, their game you know, really, in a lot of ways, was no game. And they, <laughs> they, they, needed, to, yeah. they, they needed to cross the bridge and work on their, their teaching game. So once you finished, uh, you went back to North College. Tell us about how you started, what your first job in tennis was once you graduated. Yeah, no, I I graduated. Um, Nothing was open. Um, So I uh, I started teaching in this guy's backyard. Um, I I didn't even even know the guy. I actually just, you know, was driving by, saw a court, um, ended up, you know, just ringing the doorbell. the guy was the guy was really nice. Loved tennis. Started giving him some free lessons. 
And, you know, he let me do a couple privates for some of my kids. And, um, you know, the first kid I, I started working with, um, his name was Philip. And, um, you know, he was good friends with Zach Fuchs. And then, you know, Zach Fuchs has really stuck around with me for a long time. And, and, um, you know, that was one of my first kids off to college and he's now, uh, now playing at BYU. So big lefty and that baseball pitcher, big, big lefty. And then, um, you know, from there I, uh, ended up applying for this job. Um, it was starting out as a, uh, just a two day a week type job. It was a, it was a small swim and rack club, nine courts. Um, and then it ended up, um, and I'm getting rid of the tennis director and hiring, um, you know, two co-head pros. And then we started out, um, doing that myself and another guy. And we started just building a program basically from, from the ground up. And then, um, and then he left it turned into my program and we, we, we started, um, you know, really incorporating the great base and form and, you know, we're doing that in all of our classes, you know, our, our juniors and adults. Um, so, so you must've had some naysayers, some critics at first when you started with, uh, form base because static balance is almost non-existent. Um, we always say, you know, game based form base, combine both and call it principle based. Um, yeah. but was yeah. it Rocky road at first? I know your, your players are having success now and you've been at it a while, but what was it like at first when you started? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I'd say it started off a little bit game based as I was working with the other guy, you know, game base and drill in. And then, uh, and then we switched to form and, um, you know, I sent some of my top kids out to you and, um, that's when I went out to Tampa to go visit you. And, and after that, those guys took six months off to, to work on their game. And, um, you know, from there, everybody kind of followed and started working on strokes. Um, and it just, it makes sense, you know, you, you want to, you know, start developing your game and, and you want to build, you know, build it with bricks, build it, build your foundation strong. Um, so. Yeah, there's so many stories because we're connected with so many players, but um, actually I'm always asking, we, I, I get a lot of feedback on our podcasts and we're, we're rookies with a podcast, so I'm asking for input. And, and one person said, well, you know, I mentioned a lot of names, and a lot of times people won't know. Like the other day, we are talking about a, a, a Posey, the character <laughs> Posey. And, you know, and Andy's always saying we got to give value. Well, to digress, I mean, with Posey, here's value. Get a big water jug, get a brown bag, fill it with bagels and bananas, and go hit the backboard for eight hours in a row. That's, that's, <laughs> that's value with, with Posey. With um, the the time uh, you know, with G- Great Base and um, um, this young kid Duncan, uh, I've only been communicating with his mom um, Kelly. They're from Boise, and they heard yep. your name on the podcast. Uh, why don't you tell us that story? Yeah, no, um, this is a good story. Duncan's eleven years old. Um, the mother emailed me, um, she said, Hey, you know, I looked you up. I heard your name in, in Steve's podcast. And, um, you know, we live in, we live in Boise, Idaho. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if we can come out there. It's only 10 hours away. And, um, so I emailed her back, um, found out that, uh, his coach is Christian Wyden. Um, I don't know him, but he's the head coach of uh, the Boise State team, the men's team. And um, I guess he's worked in a little bit great base with you. He has a little bit of knowledge with that. Actually, with uh, Christian, I know he's a follower. Uh, We'll have to talk a little about Aoife Wilson, who's joined your staff. But Aoife first was with me. Um, She's worked in in different capacities with me. Uh, Jennifer Roberts. Married Jim Morgan. Jennifer Roberts works with us for two years at Tennis Tech. And then Jim had been with the USTA as a national coach and world team tennis and a number of different things. And But Jennifer wanted him to be introduced to the great base once their children started playing tennis. And then they both became very good players. But, yeah, so it's interesting how it goes back 
Um, a lot of times people don't really understand the connection. The connection is information. And where, then a lot of times also two people don't really know where the information comes from and, and how many of the mentors we have. But uh, so tell us a little bit more. He's, he's there for 10 days or yeah. so? Yeah, no, he, uh, he came out for a week. Um, and, uh, you know, we were just putting him through the ringer with his form. You know, he, he did thousands of drop hits, cone work. You know, he was shadowing so much every day, two, two bounce drills. You feed the ball, it has to bounce twice, and he needs to hold his form for five seconds. You know, he was doing, he was doing the sock. And uh, for the listeners that don't know what the sock is, um, you, get a, you get a high sock, you put three tennis balls in it, and, and you swing it in a serve motion. Um, if, your, if your palm goes up, the sock stops. So it really helps you um, keep a fluid motion. I mean, he was doing that every day. Um, and basically I was just training, um, you know, him on his form and, and, and training his mother, um, Kelly on, Hey, this is how you can work with him when you're, when you're back in Boise. And, um, she did an amazing job. I mean, she was just on, you know, right next to the court, six hours, seven hours a day, just taking notes. Um, a lot of notes. I wonder, and, if, he, I wonder, uh, if, he, uh, wonder if he skis. That's a. He skis. He yeah. skis as well. Um, she was saying he's he does some ski clinics and ski teams um, back in Boise as well. That'll help a lot with the strength and the balance. Um, so, anyways, I got her out on court, and um, I think she said she's a three-five player. And you know, I, I fed her some balls and had Duncan feed her balls, and she hit a little bit too. And you know, it was crazy that she she's learned a lot of this stuff from you know, either Christian or a little bit of me and, um, your videos. And I fed her a forehand and I go, Whoa, she, she looks good on the forehand side, you know, just from watching the videos and watching Duncan for so many hours. And I almost thought, man, she, she can hit the ball better than Duncan at times, you know, um, her form was great. So I thought that was really cool. With, um, um actually someone that, uh, Brandon helped me teach years ago. Uh, her father, uh, this young gal, was an engineer, and he just just learned by watching. And he just said, "Okay, you know, he, he just had that mind. Okay, step one, step two, just like following directions." Who was that? Yeah, no, it just makes sense. Uh, give me a second, Jody, Jody, Jody. Give, give me a second. I'll think of, think of the name. Um, it was, it was, you know. With you, I mean, this goes yeah, back 15 years. Yeah, goes back. Yeah, yeah Jody, more than 15 the, years. The, the, the name will come to me in a second, but she played really well. Um, the and still plays, still plays. I saw her. Um, as with um, tell us about your staff. Yeah, no, sounds good. Um, oh, you know, another thing. Um, you know, while Duncan was out there, I, I thought this was this was pretty cool. Is he? So he worked with Mateo. Um, Mateo, Mateo is 16 years old. He's, he's worked in the great base system for a couple of years. Um, Steve, you know, Mateo. He's, yeah. Yeah. He yeah. came out and stayed with you, you know, for a few months at a time. Yeah. He's been uh, for quite a bit. Very good. Athlete. Good player. Yeah. Good player. Um, won, won the sectional in Northern California. So he's a, he's a pretty good player. Anyways. Um, I had, he's, a, he's out with a little bit of a back injury right now. And I, uh, I sent Duncan to go see Mateo. And, and Mateo just, uh, you know, has him shadowing and going through the wall drills and, you know, it was was so good, um, you know, with Mateo's information that he's got from you and me, you know, he, he can work with Duncan so well, you know, this is a 16 year old boy, um, doing such a good job helping Duncan with his form. So they spent a few hours working with Mateo. Um, I know they worked with. Um, coach Aoife, and I know you're connected uh, with Aoife through your Tyler Tech tennis program. Yeah. I just hired her last year, um, and uh, she she was working with Duncan. She was doing a great job. Um, you know, she has a ton of knowledge. Um, I think I think she's a great asset to our program. I mean, right away, I didn't I didn't have to train her. You know, she she, she just came in. And, and started working and she works with our 
uh, beginning players, adult players, and our homeschool group at times. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, she contacted me. She knew just by watching your students hit the ball, which is a great, yep. great compliment to you. Um, Cause she was just teaching in a club, what, 10 miles down the road, right? Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's less than 10 minutes down the road. Um, Bay club, Los Gatos, that's what it's called. And uh, we were there to do a junior league match one, one summer. And she said something, Hey, Hey, do you guys know Steve Smith? You know? And I go, Oh yeah. You know? And she's like, wow, I can see it. in, in all your player strokes, she's like, wow, I haven't met anybody who, who knows that information out here. Um, so from there I was connected with her, you know, she would, she would pop in at our club occasionally. And, um, you know, then once COVID hit, I said, Hey, look, our program's growing a little bit. Um, why don't you come over here and let's, let's ease you into our program. So she coaches at, um, Bay club Los Gatos still. And then she coaches, um, for us too. Um, so she does a little bit of both, but, uh, she has, she brings the energy every day. She's awesome. Um, yeah, she's from Dublin. Skilled. She played at Tyler Junior College on a tennis scholarship. Aoife Wilson, I, uh, she was 1985. I still have her on film from 1985. Um, <laughs> and, but she was a gamer. She really improved and went on and played um, at Alabama. With, but then after yeah. that, I mean, so if someone comes over, they're 18 years old. So she went through two years of training, and she played two more years of college tennis. Then she she did an internship with me, with Tennis Corporation of America, and then she did one with Vic Braden. Um, so she went back to Ireland, and I know I was in Ireland. Actually, I went to her wedding in Ireland, but um, through her a couple times, I worked with the Irish coaches. Um, but I always tease people that. Uh, I gave her personality lessons when I met her. She had no personality. So you always, I do that. I mean, take someone's a really fast runner. I go, yeah, I, I met that person. They were so slow. With, uh, <laughs> and your wife's on staff too, right? Yeah, my wife's on staff, Claire. Um, no, she's great. I uh, introduced the great base to her. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just simplified everything for her. And, you know, she says this is so good. You know, the information's Awesome. Um, she, she played, uh, she's from Arizona. Um, she was, um, normally the top player in, in Arizona. She's from Tucson. Um, so she was the top player in, uh, the Southwest section. She ended up going and playing tennis for, uh, St. Mary's out in Northern California. They're usually a, uh, top 25 in the country school, or at least they were when she was there. Um, so yeah, no, I, uh, I hired her and, and she, she's been a great asset to our program with our higher, higher level players, intermediate and beginners. Um, and of course the ladies clinic, the ladies, the ladies always love, uh, a high level female player. So with just on yeah. Brandon with his staff, I mean, yoga and nutrition and sports psychology and on and on, it, you know, may take us a couple of months, but it's, it's, I think it's so important to film everyone, even if they're just a recreational player, they haven't played. I think at a tennis club, if, if, you know, someone is uh, maybe just, they work for membership, working in sales, they they work in the office, is just, just have everybody be aware of product knowledge and this is what we're trying to produce. And the strength of the individual comes out, there's always individuality, but, um, did your wife have to make uh, some changes in her game or did she through, through uh, your teaching find out where, yeah, there, was, no, where no. there was some, some through, holes through the great base? I mean, she can, she can shadow perfectly. She can, she can hit the ball perfectly with the great base form. Um, you know, her, her actual form's slightly different, you know, but when you're rallying with her, she can, you know, have good circular swings. Um, she's recently been kind of thinking about her serve, getting it, you know, calm down more and just being loose on it. Um, no, it's good. It's, it's not only helped her, her coach, but helped her play a little bit too. So another, uh, gentleman, uh, Holt Vaughn, I've given him personality lessons. He went, he had to take the same lessons as Aoife Wilson. Um, he is, uh, 
He's got to be 47 because I know Clayton Stanley. I sent him a, a happy birthday text the other day. He, he's 47. So listeners who were with me back in the 80s, he went on and played at the University of Texas. We were at one time one player short of having three players in the Texas lineup. But he went there and he played with uh, Chad Clark, who first was introduced to tennis by Jennifer Roberts. And then, you know, Dave Anderson did the bulk of the work with, with, uh, with, with Chad. But Holt, uh, you talk a little bit about his son, Mason, who's worked with both with, uh, with you and now he's working with David Anderson. Um, he was, came to visit not too, too long ago, but why I was asking the question about your wife and technique is the brain is so powerful, so sophisticated. Um, I was just telling, I was telling a young boy today who you know as well. He's got an uncle, uh, Valentine is here visiting, and I told Brandon, I said, watch his left index finger. We're just at the court, and I go, he hadn't, he hadn't even hit a ball. And I said, he's just going to point. I go, is he saying it's out? Or is he saying he's number one? If it, and uh, I told him today, I said, if you don't really work using that left hand differently, that the way the brain works, you know. It's, kind of a morbid thought, but you'll take that to your grave. It, you know, it's Jim Lair, it's a, yeah. to make a change, it's like the cartoon where you got to s- sit under a, a stick of dynamite. But Holt, um, great enthusiasm, great energy, great work ethic. Oh, he's great. He's a great, and, and he's a great he, dad. He played at Davidson, so he played at a respectable level, but he knows that he could have gone so much further. Um you know, I, he works for Apple. I mean, he, he could have gone so much further if he had a Timex watch. But no, the the um, <laughs> the strokes. I mean, a lot of people just don't know. I mean, it's like with Roger Federer. It's like there are some nuts and bolts involved here. Yeah, I know. He's even worked on his game. You know, I know. Uh, you know, it first started out with. Uh, I think he contacted you. You put us in touch. Um, Mason went out and worked on his game and. Uh, Mason came back and was starting to train with us and Mason must've been eight or nine. You know, he was, he was pretty young. Um, I remember the first day Mason came out, uh, he was crying, you know, he didn't, he didn't want to be here. He wanted to be in his comfortable, um, form or not form based, sorry, game based program where they, they kind of goof off and, you know, hit a little bit and he, he liked that. Right. So he came out and started working on his form and, um, I'd say the first couple months were a little rough for him, but, um, you know, after that he was, he's a gamer, you know, he, he's all in. Um, and, uh, you know, I know this last year in COVID, I think they homeschooled and what they do, they stayed in Orlando with you for a while. Um, yeah, they were there. I, I'm going to guess they were there three months where, you know, there were such polite okay. people, Holt and his wife, Tracy, they come in and yeah, no. So they're they, awesome. They, they bring their little twins, and I think at the time we're gonna guess they were, were just seven. You know, they, they're probably yeah. old, you know, just shy of being nine. So they come those guys work. are are athletes. Yeah, you know, I saw them get in their five, and and no joke, they uh, they had a red ball. Mason's in the program working on his form on the back courts, and I'm looking through the windscreen, and mom's there, and the two boys are rallying hundred balls in a row with the red ball age five no joke i'm going whoa they didn't have any form but yeah. those guys those guys are athletes and, and yeah, can well, run they're athletes but i actually use a different uh way to label them i call them wild horses so they're <laughs> again they're so polite yeah. and they said well could the two little boys join in now uh, the brothers could they play for like an hour because I, I said no they cannot play for an hour they have to come the entire day and yeah. and they did and I um, with uh, that's where tennis if, what really should happen ideally is kids just really work on technique you go to your garage you go to your basement you work on technique and then you yeah. do, you do everything else to become an athlete and yeah. um, I don't think there's you know such a a great need I was talking to Matt Clure about his daughter Cammy she's very athletic and she hasn't. She's nine now. She hasn't played a lot of tennis, but she's got very good mechanics. And you just need to do a lot of reps. I don't think it's so much. I mean, look at Venus and Serena. I'm looking forward to that movie coming out on November 19th. The girls are 15 months apart. Now, I was living in Southern Cal when uh, Venus, older of the two, 
you know, she was on fire. And, you know, there's a famous story where they uh, dropped off a video for, for Vic or they mailed a video to Vic and we have it, it's online. And, uh, but after the age of 10, so Venus doesn't play another tournament. I mean, she's hitting balls and she's eventually playing sets. I know it was Stevie Longley. I've known him a long time. He was their first sparring partner. But so you got to figure, well, okay, uh, Serena's a year and a half younger. They, they didn't play junior tennis. You know, these kids are just uh, going crazy over the UTR, UTR, UTR. What you really need to do is work so much on skills. It's, it's, the, it's about acquiring skills. I mean, I, I just said to a girl today, two girls, one from Texas and one from uh, uh, Canada, Toronto, and I said, what's your mindset? Is it A or B? A, I want to win now, or B, if I keep doing the right things over and over again for a long period of time, I'm going to be really good. And they both said A. You know, they want to win. They want to win now. And that's where that you know winning can be a curse to, um, to just get people where they're not short-sighted for the, for the long yeah. run. No, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes UTR can, I mean, I think a lot of the time it, it gets in these kids' heads. You know, I, I lost to a, to an eight or, or whatever, you know, and I'm an eight five, you know, and it, it just gets in their head. And, you know, the bottom line, I think, is if you just keep working on your skills, I um, mean, you get better and better, um, you know, you'll have better wins down the road, you know, so. So, well, yeah. Tell us the story. You were with my son, Connor. I think it was at a challenger where he, he was yeah, I got points, a couple stories. two points yeah. away from beating Kudla. And I remember that forehand volley. I was watching it. He's, he's okay. It. Yeah. No, you were watching that live. Okay. Um, you, yeah, were, you, were, you were with him, right? I was there. I was there. Yeah. Um, I think Kudla, Kudla was the one seed. I think it was a hundred K or 150 K event. Um, I think Kudla had a high of around 50, 50 in the world. Um, anyways, um, I'm there early. I'm watching some of the matches and, um, you know, I'd first met Connor when we, we flew out to Tampa and we're working on strokes with, uh, Fuchs family and myself, we went out to Tampa and, um, anyways, I'm, I'm watching a match and I just have my running shoes on and Connor walks by me and goes, Hey man, you want to warm up? And I go, Oh me, you want to warm up with me? Oh, you guys didn't, like, yeah. you guys didn't even know each other? No, I knew him. I knew him because oh, okay. we, we, we worked in, we worked in Tampa oh, okay. when I came out we're working on strokes. And I had messaged him um, okay. online, said, hey, look, I'm going to come watch you play today. And uh, he said, okay, sounds good. He said, I'll see you there. And uh, anyways, before his match, an hour before his match or something, he, uh, you know, he's walking through by the courts and um, he sees me and he goes, hey, man, uh, I'm, looking for a, I'm looking for a warm-up. You want to warm me up? And I go, me? You want to warm up with me? I said, uh, okay, my racket's in the car run out to the car, get my racket and start warming up with him. And, um, you know, I think he had done much, most of his stretching and dynamic and stuff. So he only needed 20 minutes of hitting, but, uh, you know, I thought that was pretty cool. I warmed him up and then, um, he just comes out on fire. You know, I think he wins the first set on Kudla. Um, forget the score, but it might've been six, three, maybe six, two. Um, and then I think he's up, he might've been up five, was it five, three in the second? Um, maybe that's when he missed that volley. Yeah. It would have been but a big win. Um, would have been a huge win. He was playing really well. He was coming forward. Kuba yeah, was getting up that. Then, then it, you know, the Northern Cal, it, this, it was a type of match where the, in the evening, the sun goes down and then the temperature changes. It was really a, a different, a different court. Yeah. Third set. But one side note with that is, uh, is the Championship Tennis Center, I think that's the name of it in Washington. They produced a lot of tennis players. Um, Junior Ore, who came, was supposed to spend four days with us. He ended up spending four months. And he brought, he came with his grandfather, Alex um, Vukovic, who you probably know, Brandon. Sure. Was trying to talk him into go to college instead of trying to play pro. And that was the reason he came to us. But he revamped his game and so I didn't know my son Connor played him and practice many times. And then Connor played Mitchell Frank in a, in a pro tournament. Of course, Mitchell won everything in the juniors and he, he was a mental giant. He's 
This is so, so tough. Kudla said about Mitchell Frank one time, he was, being, he was hitting with uh, Nadal, and they asked Kudla, is, this, is Nadal the, the most mentally tough tennis player you've ever been around? He goes, no, I think Mitchell Frank is. <laughs> is <it> Mitchell, Frank, <laughs> Mitchell Frank had some holes in his game. I know he's teaching some in Virginia. I don't really know him, but um, I understand that he's... He can make balls, though. I was understand. You know? Yeah, I understand that he's teaching mental toughness, which he's. So, but Connor, uh, those are the big three because from that, you know, now TFO. I mean, he's from from that program, and he's really surpassed those three. But uh, it would have been kind of interesting for Connor to have the win over Kudla because he had beaten the other two. And I believe yeah, that those three the one to beat at that tournament too. In junior, ten, been... in junior tennis, those three Americans, I believe, at one time they were all top ten ITF. Um, but you warming up with Connor. Connor, um, he was in the uh, the semis of a challenger, and I remember he said everything went wrong. And I go, well, what went wrong? He goes, well, I warmed up with Rublev, and I, I was at a couple challengers with Connor, and Rublev was maybe eighteen, and the guy just. You know, he would get beat and he'd hang out all day long and just say, you want to hit? You want to hit? But just tee off on everything. And it's interesting, you know, now he, he's playing the ball, he's closer to the baseline, and people that play with speed like that, they generally end up having very short swings. So maybe they have too big a swing in the juniors, but the ball comes in deeper, faster, and the frequency, the players are more consistent. But uh, it's interesting too that I'm sure you went out and gave him a really good warm up, and people want that. People people like to warm up the way they're used to warming up instead of uh, you know like not getting not getting a rhythm. Um, yeah, no, I was just trying to make balls, right? Hey, let's get him ready, you know. Um, so that was a good experience there, and um, you know I love the way he warmed up on a serve. You know, I know he went. He kept going, okay, slice wide, slice wide. You know, I think he hit five wide, you know, and then he go flat wide. And it was just, it was a good experience for me at the time. It was just, you know, it was, it was very professional. And it was just good to be in that environment. Well, Brandon so, would have some, uh, some Connor stories because they're uh, probably I, a few too many for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, where you guys are like seven years apart, six, seven years apart. Yeah, I spent a lot of time uh, with Connor where I was driving the car and he was asleep in the passenger seat. That was, <laughs> I had this, uh, uh, I forgot the year, but a Mercury Grand Marquis, the most comfortable seats. It's like driving a recliner on wheels. I'm sure, I'm sure you took him to tournaments. The one thing yeah. about coming back to our boy po Posey is uh, Connor always wanted to go with Posey because he was the kind of guy where uh, Connor could dominate the channel changer in the hotel room and posey be like okay flanagan probably uh control that channel changer a little bit with tell us about your homeschool program is, is it you know is it difficult to convince parents to uh take the plunge yeah, and go no. from public school to homeschool you know I, I i we tried doing it you know a few years ago but it's, it's a little bit tough um i think with covid it's made it a little bit easier um, especially with, you know, the last year and a half, two years with, with these kids, um, they were already online. Right. So, um, you know, what, basically what we did with COVID out here is, you know, kids would get out of school, you know, fairly early. And we started to practice from two to six. So all the kids that can high school kids that can get out early, we'd start, you know, two to six. This is, um, during COVID. And, you know, some of these kids, um, they went up three UTRs in one year, you know, I would, I would say that was the best improvement, some two and a half and some two. Wow, so cool. they're making really good progress. You know, kids that were used to only playing two hours or maybe two and a half hours. Now they're playing four and maybe they even have a little bit more time to, you know, get into extra serving or something. So they've made a lot of progress. Um, Anyways, from there, um, yeah, no, we started our homeschool program. The kids do um, either their online learning through um, a school of their choice or they are working with um, the local high schools. Now the high schools are offering, um, you know, their online program and you can do it whenever you want. Um, so it's been great. It's, been, it's allowed these kids to, um, you know, get four hours every single day solidly 
you know, if they want to play more, or, you know, go work out on their own, you know, they have that time and that freedom. Um, so it's just, it's just going to allow us to just get better and better and just build our skills up. Um, no, that's exciting. I think a better term than homeschool is non-traditional scheduling. Yeah. Uh, the landscape of junior tennis has changed. I think to, to be um, successful, I mean, if you start really young and everything's right, I mean, you have a very good technical coach, you know, you just everything is right. You could still be successful, but the, the, the field's not level anymore. If one kid's a public school or, and I actually loved it when tennis kids play different sports and, you know, they go to school from eight to three, you know, they take a private lesson. That was it. It wasn't program. Take a private lesson. They'd call people up. They'd be calling adults up, but you, you also have more time for a fitness component. And I do think that the parents, you know, the big, I think the, the, the scare is, well, what about the academics? But the parents actually have more control knowing what their child's doing. And then, then you get the question on uh, social, socialization or social skills. And I think that's one of the reasons that you want to have a kid homeschool. I wouldn't recommend a kid to homeschool grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. But once they get into, say, sixth grade, the you know, school has been their workplace for a long time. But it gives you more time for fitness. What are you guys doing for fitness? You have some, yeah, no. some, you have someone uh, doing that on your staff who just does fitness? Yeah, no, I'm, we, well, we, we work it in the practice, um, you know, liners, spider drills. Um, we uh, just started doing box jumps, you know, trying to get a little bit more explosive. Um, you know, when I was in Kalamazoo, uh, I went to the tournament in uh, August with two of our boys you know, the game, you know, these kids are just, you know, that's the main thing. They're just so intense and physical. So coming back from that tournament, I just know, Hey, look, we got to get more physical, you know? So some kids are doing, uh, weights. Um, there's a personal trainer that helps uh, a couple of our kids. Um, we're trying to do a little bit more on court. Um, every Friday we, uh, I've hired a yoga lady and, um, she comes in, her name's Danette. Uh, she's really good. She does an hour of yoga. So, um, you know, that's just really helping us get more flexible, you know, get more balanced, you know, building some strength. And, um, you know, that's great just to open up the hips, you know, the day before the tournament. Um, so I think that's helped. And then, um, I was actually looking in to hiring some kind of speed coach, you know, and maybe these guys can work with them for a couple hours a week, but, uh, no, it's starting to build. You know, I like the line, the body's a built in gym. Ty Tucker, yeah. um, my son uh, played at Ohio State. Actually, one of our students from way back when, if people go to Tennis Intelligence Applied, we have to plug in upstate New Yorker. I know uh, Brandon has a connection with uh, Jeremy Wurtzman. Ty Tucker, like, Ty doesn't like the, the plastic ladders that tennis players use because that comes from football where the players would be going through. Um, spare tires, car tires. Um, but yeah, I think that kids need to realize that they can do fitness on the tennis court. You know, that it's not a matter of, well, I just, now, now I'm running or now I'm in the, I'm on the track, I'm in the gym, I'm lifting, but what, just what they do on the court. I, I love the spider drill. What we do the spider drill is, um, you know, how players move up, move down is you get a battery of courts. You can do the spider drill. You know, it's just now that every kid's got a stopwatch because their telephone's a stopwatch. And you have it be two out of three, and then winner moves up, loser moves down. With uh, Yeah, no, we've been rolling with the beep test. Um, you know, I like that one. Just just turn on the audio and, and beep, and you got to run and hit that line before it beeps again. Um, I got that one from, from you, and that one's been great for us. We do that every week. Um you know, so that's awesome. And then, um, I guess Alex and Mateo were, were with you at the end of August there and they go, Steve Smith made us do the beep test backwards. And I go, okay, we're going to start doing that. I like that one. That That's going to build the quads, you know? Yeah. You know, it's one thing you gotta be careful of. You ask, ask Aoife, um, you really have to pay attention. I remember one time Aoife, when she was with us as a, as a player fell backwards you gotta be careful when you do that. You know, you have to, you don't want the younger kids to do that unless, 
You know, the, okay. the one thing is not not to do it on a hard court, do it on a field. But you know, you have okay. strong, you have stronger players, but it can be it can be a little bit dangerous to have little kids do that. One thing uh, right. with, with Brandon, um, you know, he's just getting started. Is a great concept he's put together, but uh, we hope with all the coaches, you know, that whether we use the term network, connection, alumni, to, to uh, you know. To, to, to connect with, um, like, how do you do these yoga drills at home? Or he has a nutritionist, sports psychologist. Um, but, yeah, I like the Spanish theme where it's 50% tennis and 50% fitness. With, um, yeah, I know, I, I know uh, you know, Brandon's just getting started with that. But, um, you know, down the road, how cool would it be to have someone, you know, I don't know, come in and, and set up the filming, right? And then they just they meet you at your performance center, and and you have just someone who's just going over strokes, and you know that that just be another addition you can add, just totally cool. Absolutely, I think kind of trying to find that synthesis between the the physical aspect and the technical aspect is uh, is definitely one of the things we're 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 trying to achieve. So absolutely, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Brand, why don't you tell them a little bit uh, just a few of the ideas that your your nutritionist has about taking kids to the grocery store? Some of the things you're telling me today. Sure. Yeah. So just speaking to her about how how she could uh, help help the students that Steve is is working with, and and uh, and to do it in such a way where um, to eat to have a healthy diet and to improve their performance through their nutrition, to do it in such a way where it's not uh, very expensive. Um, she was. She was suggesting taking the kids through the grocery store, showing them the options that they could purchase, and then actually then teaching them how to meal prep, uh, similar to uh, a you know fitness form competitor where they have their meals laid out for the entire week, but teaching them how to cook and meal prep and and what the you know what the nutrients are and and why they're important. Oh yeah, that'd be very valuable. But I, I think obviously, you know, one of the reasons why once a, once a player might meet Steve or someone who's been trained in the system is the the educational component of it to, to understand why you're doing what you're doing and, and what it is you're putting in your body and and uh, to have the knowledge behind it. It makes someone like you said when you saw that you started playing better. You know, when, once you've made the changes in your game, to then see the you know see the difference in their their uh, speed on the court, their strength, uh, all from the nutritional component. One thing, yep. go ahead, Steve. Oh, you know, I was just going to throw in a comment, you know, just the recovery and everything. You start eating better, you're going to recover better. You right. know, your, your body feel better, less, less little aches and pains. And um, it just, right, it all goes together. I was talking to Rob Krychek just the other day. I talked to him all the time. I've known his son seven, since he was seven, so he's, Go okay, 20, 25 years, but you know the key word is prehab. You know, it's just, it's not rehab; it's doing all the work afterwards. But coming coming back to the grocery store, um, I've had many of my students who've gone on to coach tell their their students that they send to work with us. Maybe they've been here for two, three weeks, and they say, "Well, you know, now he knows you better than your parents do." Not meaning I I know the kid better than the parents, and I do that math with parents. We all say, well, you got two children. How old is the oldest one? Well, he's 14. And, well, you got 14 years experience with one kid, and now you have two kids. Now they're seven years apart. So you got two years. You have seven years experience with two kids. Uh, but let me just finish up on this. Uh, you've got opposites to track. So it's one thing to study nutrition. I, I took a graduate course. I got an A in it. It was totally over my head. I didn't have enough, you know, background in biology and chemistry. It was like, are you kidding me? I thought there was going to be the do's and don'ts of nutrition. I remember the professor Sloan, he was very dynamic. He came in, he threw three books at each of us and we had to do a book report on each book. And the one book I remember was the one room diet. It's pretty good theory that you can only eat in one place. You can't chip and, you know, have some chips in the car or whatever. But this is how it works in a grocery store. Opposites attract. So the thinker marries the feeler. I mean, you can just keep it off the Myers-Briggs. That's simple. Because one of the parents generally, and he, I mean, sometimes it's the mom more so than, than not, that, you know, that's not, that's not fair that the, the mom ends up doing more multitasking. So, but the mom, it's majority of times at the grocery store. But with 
when the, the mom, say the mom's pushing the grocery cart down the aisle, if the kids can just throw anything in the cart they want, you got a, you got a problem. You got a problem. So the a lot of cocoa uh, pebbles with, um, yeah, you know, I think also too, um, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you can have a cheat day and you gotta be, just be so consistent with nutrition. Um, but no, it, it'd be great. I mean, it's amazing what Brandon has here under one roof and the synergy gets everyone working together. But I think assessments should be more than just forehands and backhands. You know, years ago, um, you know, Craig Tyler's was a long time. His name comes up quite often and he got a master's in kinesiology and we used to do body composition. You know, we used to do a lot more with fitness testing. Um, we also, when we would film people years ago, we would film returns. We would film, um, approach volleys. So I think we also, uh, have to say, okay, we got to make sure that we don't as professionals lower the standards. Um, and that's a Bradenism, never lower your standards. People come to visit our program and I'll yell out three and three and it depends on how old they are. They go, what do you mean three and three? If it's someone, uh, maybe Brandon's age, they're going to go, it used to be one and one, <laughs> but for a while it was two and two. And I say that after three and three, cause you work with younger kids who can't pick up four balls in each hand pretty soon. We're say, why don't you kids just sit down and play on your cell phone? And we'll, we'll pick, <laughs> we'll pick the balls up for you. I mean, it's really, it's getting, getting that bad with, tell us about adult tennis. Um, you know, I mean, I, our listeners, we don't cross over enough. Tennis is tennis to us, recreation tennis, competitive tennis. Tell us about um, Brookside Tennis, Saratoga, California. What about your adults with your, you know, you have leagues, yeah. you have... have um, no, no, definitely. We, we do it all at the leagues. The ladies have, um, you know, their inner club. They have their USTA league teams. Um uh, they have their clinics. IFA, IFA has taken over quite a few clinics. IFA and my wife Claire run quite uh, quite a bit of the adult clinics um, at the club. Now that I'm working, um, you know, more full time with with some of our uh, homeschool players in that program. Um, the clinic we did today is a uh, it's a form clinic, and it's for um, beginning players to start, and they're coming in and. You know, usually we have them just warm up and catch their finish on their drop hit, you know, and we're just really introducing just one stroke every week and just attacking it. And um, so cool to see, you know, someone who's only been playing, you know, maybe a half a year tops and some of these people, maybe even only a couple months tops. And it's like they're hitting a really nice, solid forehand. Um so that's pretty refreshing to go see them, you know, on a ball machine, you know, um, you know, practicing the right way, practicing the correct form, um, normally, um, and this still happens at our club, but you see people hit on the ball machine and, and they're just trying to whack it as hard as they can. And, and it's make one, miss one over there, make one, miss one. And, um, they got the elbow brace on and, um, you know, their form isn't too good. So, pretty refreshing to go help an adult and, um, you know, just help them on their form, you know, give them a really good start, you know, whether you're 40 or 50 and you're just starting, um, let's help you start the right way. Well, it takes years so, and years to develop a culture. Is there a crossover where, I mean, even the language or the, sometimes you see like a, a mom or a dad, they're practicing with their son, they're tossing balls and their practice partner. Yeah, or, no. Um, yeah, it takes a while to get to that stage. Um, we do have some parents with the kids that are also in the program and they're feeding balls to each other. Um, it doesn't always work like that. You know, you have the kid and he just takes his lesson and he just built his forehand up and, you know, you have the parent the next day that's just rallying with their five-year-old son baseline to baseline and the kid can only make a couple balls, right? Um, so you have that as well. But, um, no, we're working on that. And, and I think the longer that I stay here, the better, the better it's going to get. Um, so oh, that's great. Uh, my number one podcast coach is Andres Barbosa. And he said, we've well, run out of content because Andy had, had me doing these Steve stories and we have just been busy. We have to get back to doing some of those, but here's one. Um, 
I'm in Japan. The first thing I ever saw when I stepped off an airplane is I look out the window at the airport and there's a new crew come out on the airfield and they circle up and they're doing exercises. So it was, I was just shocked to go to Japan and how the juniors and the adults, they train the same. I one time was doing an adult clinic. I have done you know, quite a few adult camps and such, but I just kind of forgot what I was doing. And I just said, uh, okay, uh, run a couple laps. And the guy, everyone, they, I could just sense that everyone was staring at me because when the adults come out, they don't run a couple laps. <laughs> but one of, the, one, one of the craziest things, uh, everybody likes to go back home, so I, I enjoy going back to Rochester. I did some things, Brandon mentioned that the other day when we introduced him, the last podcast, that everybody likes to go back home. So I'm in Rochester, New York, and it's really cold weather like you've experienced in Michigan. And these ladies would get in the sauna, they would come in and they, they would take off their winter jackets and before they would go out and play, they would just sit in the sauna and visit for a few minutes and that was their way to warm up. The, uh, oh, my gosh. So with, uh, but no, with uh, Aoife and your wife, Claire, correct? Yeah. With yeah. The, you're, very, you're very fortunate in a, in a why why is it that way? I know in Russia it's it's not quite the opposite, but there's more female coaches than male coaches, but you're very fortunate to have two um female coaches. Um I think it's uh it's very good for a young boy. My mother used to say that if if a if a coach is, you know, in the sports telling them what to do, because a lot of times in elementary school, you know, you can't generalize and say straight across the board, but too many times it's uh there's not enough tough love. My mother used to say it's too bad in elementary schools that there weren't more uh, men uh, teaching tennis. I think the profession is 90% male. Um, but they have uh, Aoife, and you see that where the kids are a little bit shocked when they have a female coach uh, reprimanding them? Oh, yeah, no. The boys listen to Aoife. I mean, she when she's out there, she's not messing around. Um She's serious. No, she's she's been a great part of our program, um, you know. And with with the with the ladies' clinics and and the men's clinics, I mean, I almost think Claire Claire's been more popular at the club than me, you know. And um, so that was that was definitely a good pickup. And then Efa Efa's only been there, you know, a short period of time, but everybody's going, "Who's this lady? Who's this lady?" And and Efa is great because you know she's going to tell you how it is. Hey, you need to hit a forehand like this. This is why you do it. You know, so um, no, it's interesting Aoife, for me with awesome. with, with Aoife, um, Remember, Richard Hernandez has been on a podcast, and Richard was so easygoing when he was a student studying tennis, and he can growl like a bear. Um, Scotty Perelman, who coached the University of Florida, we had him on a podcast. We were working together at Vic Braden Tennis College, where we're just working primarily with adults. Smitty, Smitty, Smitty. I remember he, he, he said, well, I don't think, Smitty goes, I don't think you're serious enough to coach juniors. Um, <laughs> but once someone signs that, they, they write on that profile sheet that, you know, their goal is they want to play college tennis. I mean, they, they write that down. We'd love to have people fill out the goal sheet. Obviously, you can't do that with young eight, nine-year-olds, but um, have the kid go off by themselves and, and they write down what their goals are. So you, um, you go that go that way. Um, how about parents observing practice? Is I know pan, with the pandemic that um, was kind of yeah, no. off the charts. But uh, yeah, parents come, you know, they're watching. They're yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'd say right now, um, you know, parents watching practice they they understand. You know, they understand the, the technical development. Um, you know, I think right now, you know, this period we've had you know, the best tennis parents I've ever had, you know, the last, you know, 10 years that I've been, been working with kids, um, they get it. And I'm trying to get a lot of them to listen to the podcast and watch the course. And, and the more they dive in to the information, the, you know, the easier it is to work with them. Um, so yeah, no, I, I have, I have a great group of parents right now. Um, and they're doing whatever they can to, to help out you know, and monitor their kids. Oh, just, so. earlier, just earlier today, um, uh, mom called me up, and a young six-year-old son, a four-year-old daughter, and uh, 
you're listening to the podcast and it's just great. Um, with how about, um, are other coaches in the area supportive? I mean, I think what's great is, uh, you know, I, in, when we opened, I said, you know, American tennis needs, uh, a lot more Steve Roberts out there, you know, doing such a great job teaching from a technical standpoint, but what about in the area? Are the coaches paying attention or have you, have you tried to do any of that where you have coaches workshops and you share what you're, what you're teaching? I haven't, I haven't done a workshop, but definitely, um, you know, Aoife just mentioned last week, she knows a guy, he wants to come by, you know, watch our program. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always open if anybody wants to come by and, and learn and, and, and come in and, um, just see the way we do things. I think we're doing things, um, you know, differently than, than the norm, um, you know, with, with the technical development side, um, you know, I, I think the norm is that these academies or clubs or clinics, it's, uh, Hey, we're going to drill, you know, um, not really going to work on technique. We're going to spar a little bit and, uh, you know, Hey, we're going to, you know, Johnny needs to work on his forehand in the private lesson. You know, we're not going to touch it throughout the week in the clinics, but Saturday morning we're, we're going to work on that forehand for one hour. So I just feel, um, you know, sometimes a lot of places only, you know, only do technique for an hour a week during their private or two hours or whatever it is. Um, but anyways, going, going back to your your question. Yeah, no, I'm totally open. If if any coach wants to come by and and see what we're doing, um, you know, I think it'll be very beneficial to anybody. Yeah. I think you can contact high school coaches too. It's too bad. High school coaches, they don't really, for the most part, have a feeder system working with elementary kids and junior high. And, um, but yeah, I think a lot of times what happens is instead of tennis coaches working together, um, a little bit of infighting where it's, you know, people are trying to re- recruit. If there's 20 good kids in the area, everybody's trying to recruit those 20 players. Uh, you know, Brandon has a term, uh, you know, a leech where it's like, okay, I'm just going to le- leech onto this player. And, you know, certainly I think, uh, in the, us, us, uh, junior development coaches, we can have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder with college coaches because, you know, they're just parading around going, okay, I'm wearing my school colors and I'm talking to these really good players and I have scholarships to offer and the hard yards has been, have been done. Um, are you listening, Raleigh Grossbaum? There you go, Raleigh. You, <laughs> with, uh, Raleigh is somebody, he's a fair state graduate. Uh, he did hard yards with us and he's at Dartmouth right now. Um, but yeah, I think that's with, with Andy's help and his wife, uh, more people, are learning about the great base and it's really, again, it's Braden and Vandermeer, Van Horn, all these, it's not, uh, you know, and, that, and, that, and we're going to try and try to just keep giving out free content because, you know, the, I don't yeah, to- I got a, I got a funny story. You know, I was just at sectional, um, last week watching some of the boys play, you know, and I'm cheering on Alex a little bit and a uh, kid comes up to me, he must be 13, 14 and sits next to me and he goes, Oh, are you his coach? And I said, yeah. And he goes, Oh, do you, I think he's been watching our Instagram or something. I know he's been watching your Instagram because he goes, Oh, are you guys, do you guys like teach great base? You know, and this is just some kid at, you know, some local academy, right. You know, asking, Oh, do you teach great base? So, um, I know people are looking, you know, and, uh, I know if they, they, they keep looking, they're going to, they're going to keep learning. Actually, Joey Johnson, who we had on a great base or on a podcast, he was working for the USTA and he's at an academy and out of nowhere, you know, the person is introducing before he introduces Joe, he's actually got a few announcements to make. And one, th- one of his announcements was whatever you do, don't listen to anything about the great base. And, you know, Joey's a great dad. So what he does is he takes his son, Spencer, who's a little bit older. So the clinic, the USTA, you know, clinic where they brought in these top kids in the, in the area. Um, they're 14 years old. And at that time, you know, Spencer's like 17 and Joey said, well, you know, he, he's been just doing this uh, great base program, you know, since he was a kid. So no, we, we definitely have our critics and we, we tease that we should every other month call the program solid fundamentals. Let me, let me tell you an Aoife story. So, um, she sets it up where I'm talking to the coaches, the Irish coaches and 
you know, we'd love to help tennis in Ireland. What a, what a beautiful place. We spent a lot of time in Ireland. Great people. So, yeah, they bring in, uh, at that time, years ago, there wasn't really tennis. So they have the, you know, they bring in the best boy in the country or whoever could play a comp. So was, the kids are all ranked one, two, or three. So one boy in the 12s, one girl in the 12s. So same thing, the 14s, 16s, 18s. So I have eight players. And... Um, one of the uh, coaches raised his hand. He goes, so you're command style. And I just said, well, um, let me just do this. And I said, Aoife, do me a favor. I said, just take the eight players in the back of the court and um, I'll just call off the footwork drills, the conditioning drills, and you can do those. Because I didn't want to have the kids hear what I had to say. And I said, no, I'm not command style. And part of the question, too, is the term at that time was, are you, are you self-discovery? And, and granted, people do learn through self-discovery, but um, Vic Braden, show me how to hang on to the racket. And so I, then I, I just, I said, okay, I mean, these kids are really good. You got to give them credit. They're the best of their environment. I'm not insulting Irish tennis. This would happen anywhere in the world. These kids can't hit the broadside of a barn. And that comes back to people for me say this over and over again. Crummy plays crummier. Who wins? Crummy wins, but crummy does another crummy. So you, you just say, all right. I'm going to feed you this ball at 30 miles an hour to your forehand volley. And it's got to land in the service box, which is the size of a small living room. You know, it's 13 and a half by 21. And can you get the ball in the service box? And, you know, it comes back to the basketball coach. If that kid was in a boat, he couldn't hit water. And I, so I, so I quickly put the kids through the tiebreaker desk. And you could run that as a tournament. I said, okay, we just did it again. I said, let's count how many balls we hit. And, you know, you, so you just have round one as a forehand volley. There's only eight kids, so now you're down to four. Now the next <laughs> shot, next shot you got to hit a four-hand approach shot, and now you only have yeah, one. Quadrant, quadrant tournament. Yeah, the, quad, the quadrant tournament. And so, you know, if you have really good players, you need to use a couple basket of balls to do that, if you're, especially if you're giving them a courtesy feed. Um, so No, we just ran it the other day. Um, it's great. No, and that, that creates a little bit of pressure, too. We ran it into practice, and I go – all right, winner, winner doesn't have to pick up, you know, and a few rounds, they're getting tight, you know, they're, they're starting to get tight. This is like a tournament. This is like a third set tie break, you know. Um, it's great. Yeah. You know, a kid who has a very good foundation, Brandon started, Alex Cairo, and then his family moved to Dallas, and he works with Dave Anderson, and he's become one of the best players in Texas. He's always been ranked very high, and um, he when he goes through the tiebreaker test, I remember he did it with uh, this young kid, Victor Lilov. Um, I think that's a fun story that you showed up. Uh, that's a great story. You brought a group and watched Victor win the Orange Bowl, correct? Yes, we've we've seen Victor a few times. Once in um, Tampa, the first time we were out, Victor was eight years old, I believe. Yeah, maybe he, nine. You got hat, hats off to his family. So well. Hats off to his family. I mean, he's just in a final the other day. He's 17 years old. He's in the junior Wimbledon final. But this is what needs to happen. So he wins the Orange Bowl and has lunch. Within two hours after the Orange Bowl, you had brought a little six-year-old girl, had a Western grip, and he's teaching her. And at uh, Tropical Park, he's got her in Miami. It's where uh, Andres and J.D. Barbosa run a program. And um so there's obviously there's a flat wall somewhere and Victor, I go take her to the wall and make her just rub a ball up and down in the wall. So her grip is Eastern, but um, that's what, that's what he was doing uh, two hours after he won the orange ball. I think what happens with players, not, I'm not, I'm not referring to Victor. Braden used to always say this is the player doesn't change when they have success, but everybody around the player changes. And I think that's, that's much different in the sport that I grew up. I mean, in the sport I grew up in, the better you got, you know, you know, the more criticism you would get, you know, you'd go up and, you know, people would just give you grief. And uh, I think that's what happens. And that my father used to always use the term prima donna. Uh, one thing I want to ask you about DMP, um, daily monitoring program. Um, I know you helped out so much. I mean, what are you doing with that? I know some people have just done it uh, so faithfully day in and day out, but what I mean, you could tell the listeners what it is and what do you think we can do to improve that? Yeah, no, daily monitoring uh, program. Um, 
forget the app that we had, but it, it was all set up through this app and um, the kids would, would film themselves doing their shadow swing routine um, every day, you know, along with um, a little bit of fitness, whether it was burpees, 10 burpees, squats, um, you know, just a little bit. Um, but you know, it only takes two, three minutes and, and, and you submit, um, to the app and, and then you're done for the day and it just, it gets kids, you know, rackets in their hands and, you know, you know, working on their strokes and then just adds a little bit of fitness. So, um, I think it's good. I think it jump starts their day. Um, that right. was really good. We were, what was that? No, go, go ahead. I was just saying, yeah, no, we were doing it, um, all through COVID, um, I want to say that uh, I think we have stopped a little bit, but almost everybody was doing it, and I made it a rule: Hey, look, you need to do this before practice. So, so guys are getting in, you know, a few shadows and a little bit of fitness before practice. Um, and we were we were on that, you know, all the way through COVID. But I was told by your players that you did it to the point where if they didn't do it, they couldn't practice. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. We 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 were on that and. You know, if, if they did it late, they, I was giving them fitness a little bit. So um, it got to the point where it's like, hey, look, this this is very serious. I want you guys to, you know, be on this. Um, you know, but I, no, I think we should get on that. Oh, on this end of it, uh, uh, Coach Ilya has helped us out so much over the last five years, so dedicated, you know, high-level coach, really a total package coach. Where, um, So he – he put it together, and this is before the pandemic. And you know, we called it back because there was a few hiccups. And then when we put it out there, we did have over. Uh, I know Dave Fish from Harvard, from Boston, from former Harvard coach. He was so excited. We said, "Yeah, I think we have 450 people signed up now." Some of them were coaches, some of them were um, adults, but we really wanted the older kids to do it. Where we thought, you know, they create a community. Then we we streamlined it where it's so easy to do. You know, do a 42 second drill with seven strokes or 48 with eight strokes. You know, just do these, you know, you know, 10, 10, and 10, 10 push ups, 10 squat thrusts, 10, 10 burpees or squat thrusts. Um, but what yeah, thoughts? No, I still get the emails. I still get the emails of the kids doing it. And, and yeah. you know, those kids have upped it out and continue to do it. With, um, yeah, we tell kids when they go to college, you know, make sure you, you're on campus, take a ball. A ball hopper with you, take a cone, take a sock, find out where there's a mirror, where you do the mirror routine, find out where there's a backboard. Because, you know, people think they grow away from basics. If they study other sports, that's really not the case. But um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, we've had discussions on how to improve it, but it, we, we, uh, any thoughts you have, uh, I mean, certainly we, you could come back and give me a call and we could discuss that. Um, yeah, sounds good. With um, while you're on the line, do you have any questions for Brandon? Is uh, we can wrap it up here. Any questions on what he's doing with his um, project here? Yeah, no, I was just listening to the podcast earlier today, and um, it all just seems like a great idea. Um, it's only going to make tennis better. So, congrats on on just getting that started, and and um, you know, I hope I hope it goes well, and uh, I'm glad we can finally. Uh, get in touch a little bit, even if it's through a podcast. So no, th thanks for the kind words and, and keep up the great work in, in California. One thing, uh, by being, you know, it's, um, I mean, the USTA, a lot of great people, a lot of great things done, but for us in Orlando, this was happening before the pandemic is we knew that we needed to come down to the Boca area. Um, you know, the U UTR and the USTA, I don't think they really connected like they needed to years ago. And, um, you know, we weren't um, getting our kids on clay enough, and then we weren't, you know, we're too far away from, from tournaments. So, I mean, I um, we need to set a schedule where, you know, work with, you know, continue work with coaches or yourself, but where it's not so much just a drop in where you, you can come and people – Oh, I guess people could do that. But, um, say, okay, this is when I have school break, or this is when I'm, um, you know, I don't have. You have to play some USTA events, so you definitely can get into the nationals. Yeah, I, I think one thing is that people a lot of times are too much too worried about the USTA ranking, 
and it's a little inconsistent how they even um, do seeding at a tournament. But to me, it's like if you're going to win the tournament, you got to beat everybody anyway. So I wouldn't be worried about seeding. But no, they um, to get kids to come down and uh, you can train anywhere. You can get great. You can really have super strokes and super ball striking skills. Get super fit, um, but you do have to uh, get to the competition. And I do think that's one thing about Florida. You know, I know around the country there's clubs uh, that have clay. I was talking to a Texas player the other day and said, "Well, yeah, you you have some access to clay, but." There's not that many, if any, clay court junior tournaments, but to get people to play on clay, I think it takes it takes people a year if they can train on clay for a year where they can really move on it well. But um, no, Steve, I think it's great. I, um, you know, with Andy, uh, we'll get Andy back in the swing, but um, I asked Andy, I said, well, should we just not do the podcast for a couple of weeks? And no, he said the show must go on. And with, uh, but no, I appreciate you, uh, taking the time and I just hope when we sign off that everything worked out and this is, if this is recorded (laughs) with uh, crossing my fingers, crossing your fingers, but uh, the machine is only as smart as operator and uh, coming back to whole Vaughn was super guy. He works for Apple and he was nice enough to offer me an Apple watch. And I said, you know, this is fantastic, but I'll never wear this. It's too complicated. (laughs) I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go with the Timex. But no, technology, um, we need to have technology work for us, not against us. And I'm all for technology, but I'm not for kids spending uh, endless hours on a telephone. How, how do you do that? You mean you have kids, uh, just one last question. Do you have kids that are losing too much time on? Um, on I mean, definitely. I think, I think every kid, every kid is on their phone too much these days, you know, whether it's Instagram, you know, Facebook, et cetera. But, um, no, they gotta they gotta be able to put that away and and, and put in the work. I'll just end so. by saying this: George Goldoff, um, yeah, you know, junior player. I, I'm sure. I'm pretty you know, sure he's ranked one. You were at Newcomb's, right? Together. I met him at I met him at John Newcomb Academy. Yeah, when he was 16, I was hitting balls with him. Um, were you an instructor? That was. Yeah, so I did an internship. Um, one, one summer, um, through Ferris, that was a good part of Ferris. They gave you some internships. I did something called a work play internship, uh, worked a little bit around the facility, um, helped the camps. And then I got to play with the actual full-time Academy. So I was just out there sparring with those guys. Um, so yeah, that's how I met him. Oh, oh, we've, we've made this move and, uh, I need to tell our listeners, uh, I do have one of George's socks from the. University of Texas, but, uh, but he, you know, he went through, he went through junior tennis. He was ranked one. And then obviously he played at the University of Texas. That's big time tennis. Um, now his story, he ended up, uh, because of the pandemic where he was with us for seven months. But I just, I think to end with that is, um, you know, when you first, um, were videotaped and then you you know, well, should I listen to this guy? Should I not listen to this guy? I think you have to listen to math, you have to listen to science. If someone has a rationale, but then it, it takes time. And if people, you know, give it time, the, again, the strength in the individual comes out. There is always style, but um, no, I think it's great what you're doing. We need to have more fact-based coaches, and, and especially the where you, you no substitute for a good beginning where you're helping the, helping the younger players. But, uh, no, thanks for your time with the podcast. Uh, we'll sign off and, uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again in person. Cool. Thanks guys. Let's, Great. uh, let's stay in touch. Great yeah. talking to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much. Good, good job. Great. See ya. Bye. Bye. Flanagan, Flanagan, Flanagan. Closing comment. Yeah, I think it's great to talk to Steve. Like I said earlier, it's uh, it's been a relationship where I just I see his his uh, his content pop up on social media, and he's got kids hitting the ball incredibly well, uh, and fish, efficient sw- uh, swings, and and uh, he has his kids working hard, and that's what it's all about. But it's great to connect with him, and we really need more coaches like Steve out there in in the U.S. and and abroad as well, doing what he's doing. Yeah, you can go to his uh, website, Brookside tennis training brookside tennis training and you can just tell by one photo just up by one photo but uh i'll just end where i started american tennis needs more steve roberts
But thanks for listening, everybody. 